Um, uh, my name is Nathan Richards. I'm at uh, Sussex University, uh, just in my first year of my PhD. Um, what I'm going to present to you today is a kind of uh, speculative musing, uh, more comfortably situated in the genre of Afrofuturism. It considers by way of a simple example the potential future of the masquerade spirit in the digital communications age how this staple of Igbo culture is already reaching beyond its core audience, challenging both its Igbo origins and nature and potentially finding a new and global community to torment, instruct, and entertain in ways divergent from the cultural context and customs of its origins. The paper I'm presenting to you today is a preliminary inquiry into a topic that will form an aspect of my PhD research, and so I encourage you to share any feedback or comments with me today, um, as this will help shape my field work, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm not at all an expert in masquerade, so um, your comments will be welcomed. The main function of this paper is to ask the audience to consider with me some of the implications of the global communications age, uh, with particular reference to the role of the masquerade. First, though, I'd like to just offer you some contextualization uh, of the wider area of my work. My research looks broadly at the way digital tools and space impact the way in which we engage and think about the historical, how more specifically uh, how we think about the past in both a professional and community capacity. Digital technology has, over the last decade, become a ubiquitous presence throughout much of our lives. Within Africa, mobile technology, that is wireless technology, is the dominant mode through which most access the World Wide Web and its resources, unlike countries in the West that continue to predominantly use desktop computers and laptops to access the internet. Not only is this technology an integral part of our everyday lives from shopping, communicating, and doing business, it also presents us with space, both in the abstract and in the digital sense, to perform, explore, and contest the prevalent cultural practices of our specific cultural backgrounds. Throughout the West, history as a discipline has been the preserve of the academic. In his or her role as the purveyor of historical truth, the historian exerts authority over the narratives of the past. The Western historian, so sure of her methodology, approach, and authority, has gone as far as to discredit, reorder, and emphasize what he believes to be of historical importance within the cultures of Africa, Asia, and the Americas, with little concern as to the specific cultural context that shaped events preceding the present in these cultures, and indeed the role and significance of the past within these communities in the contemporary. The Western historian in the digital age faces a challenge to his authority. Emerging online are a range of counter-historical narratives, memories, and practices that pick and choose their source from a range of culturally relevant personal recollections, digital archives, and online historical debates, many of which exist in non-written forms. In the flattening of hierarchical information flows present in the digital environment, public history in the digital age is expanding our insight into the past, with voices once marginalized from the centers of historical work able to now contribute and in so doing contest dominant narratives of the past. We see this in a rise of digital history projects dedicated to women, working class, colonial, black, LGBTQ history projects online, often presented uh, by members from those communities, drawing on the personal collections of members, as well as content found in more institutional archives, which are now available online. The response of the professional heritage and history field has been to embrace, reluctantly, these shifts in authority by developing a range of co-participation projects, inviting members of the public to contribute to the curatorial process of online archives and historical projects. In my own work, I like to think of broadcast platforms such as YouTube and social media environments like Facebook as informal archives, and the comments sections as part of the kind of historical dialogue and debate we see in the professional field and uh, as well as uh, on offline in offline community dialogue, where people share their culture, the stories of the past uh, related to their family and to the wider community. While, while much of my work 
focuses on the professional response from Western institutions to these changes in the historical and heritage field with a specific focus on the impact of African history, another key aspect of my work is concerned with the way digital tools, spaces, and theories shape the historical memories emerging from African communities on the continent, communities in which notions of time differ from the chronological necessity prevalent throughout the historical field, where historical narratives are connected to artistic cosmological practices such as oral traditions, storytelling, sculpture, music, ceremonies, ancestral remembrance, and masquerades. I consider how these localized historical memories and practices are negotiated in a global communications medium. Today, I am particularly concerned with asking those present to think about how the introduction of digital tools into ceremonial, sacred, and once restricted spaces, along with the dissemination of this content into the digital realm, impacts how the masquerade is engaged and thought about in a global communications age. How will the masquerade innovate in the digital era to remain relevant? As the Igbo community, both at home and in the diaspora, begin to take advantage of the digital apparatus at our disposal to stay in touch, create, and maintain transnational community, and to mediate their everyday lives, new rules of engagement are emerging, and older, more established cultural norms, practices, spaces, and beliefs are undergoing rapid changes and challenges. As Onye uh, mentioned in the morning lecture, the fragility of the culture is exposed in every generation. In what ways is that happening in the age of the digital? In January of this year, following a conversation uh, with Louisa regarding this very topic, I was tagged in this post here uh, on Facebook. And now I'm not sure of the specific details of this masquerade, as there seemed to be some confusion regarding this, as you'll see in a moment. Now, while I'm uh, interested in the historical knowledge tied up in the masquerade, what story or insight regarding the past this performance retains, I'm equally interested in the cultural form to which this past is embedded, and particularly the way in which the digital allows us to engage with the historical knowledge in a more culturally authentic manner, as it was intended, unlike a written interpretation of this performance. However, counter to this opportunity is the way in which the presence of this video online challenges the very cultural norms associated with masquerade. Let me unpack that a little bit further for you. Immediately, the first thing I noticed was the title for this video. <laughs> Here, the video is trying to reproduce the kinds of privileged restrictions that exist in the original cultural context of the masquerade. But surely such a thing is not at all possible in an era of camera phones and the World Wide Web. Masquerades are tied to the performative remembrance of ancestors, of a community's past deeds and achievements. They retain instruction and comment on, the individu on individuals and communities within society, and they reflect cosmological beliefs. The knowledge or secrets of the masquerade are not always open or available to everyone. Some ceremonies and masquerades are specifically for the initiated, others are gender specific, some are not to be viewed by those outside the community. It's not possible to truly know the intention of why the video recorder placed this caution or restriction on the title. He could simply be repeating what he had been told. It could be because he was under the impression that women viewing this video will be met with some unknown misfortune, and so he was offering a kind word of warning. Regardless, if part of the cultural power of the masquerade is its mystique and restriction, does the contemporary digital age signal the end of this practice, or does the new medium present the spirits of the masquerade with a new playing field and a new global audience, along with new rules to accommodate this new context. We see here that the uploading and sharing of this uh, video enables members of the community, presumably now in the diaspora, the chance to connect with home, to reminisce and stay in communication with, with each other and the, and the home culture. While digital mediums filter out some of the more mundane activities of home life, it does allow participation in significant events and facilitates a sense of ebonness across the distance. There are a few comments from this diaspora community group concerned with understanding why this video was shared online. Others provide details of the performance and some offer a correction on the type of masquerade it is. Very few comment on the restriction in the title, presumably because such restrictions are common knowledge in the real world. I hope you can read some of those. No, we can't. 
God has the one here. One. I was, I was, which one? This one. This has some content here. <laughs> Remnants. Okay. Uh, the weight of the critique regarding this restriction for women is reserved for a different kind of diaspora or citizen and the more general global audience who happen to view this content. This is the title of of the post through which I discovered this video. While there are undoubtedly issues is, uh, regarding gender prevalent throughout Igbo society, just as there are throughout all cultures, in the global communications age, the local context of a community's culture is often lost, resulting in these communities being measured and judged not by their own local customs from which these cultural artifacts emerge, but by the local customs and norms of the viewers. This kind of cultural, moral, and ethical transnational uh, exchange moves in multiple directions, but there are certainly uneven and unresolved historical tensions. Perhaps because this video was framed by this poster here as a challenge to Igbo patriarchy, we get the kinds of comments that follow. People watch this video not out of genuine interest, but in a need to contest the perceived patriarchy, adding comments that border on the offensive at times. Perhaps this is the spirit of the masquerade, continuing on in its role of admonishing and critiquing society. Having escaped the confines of the original locality into the digital ether, it has found new allies, and like a deceptive family member, it uses its knowledge of you to bring you shame, courting others to point fingers at you. Despite a number of comments suggesting this video was actually, uh, can actually be viewed by women, the original poster doesn't change the title, and those viewing it uh, to challenge the perceived patriarchy, continue to lament the inherent misogyny they see and the intention of the original poster and the culture at large. The video is serving various kinds of audiences, audiences that sometimes interact but more often than not remain within their cultural theatre or digital bubble. The correction that perhaps could be applied to the video remains unchanged. The video, like any good masquerade spirit, takes on a life of its own, with multiple meanings serving different functions to the different online communities. For one group, it is proof of the misogyny inherent in Igbo life. For another, it is a warm reminder of home. And for a more passive viewer, it is nothing more than aesthetically pleasing. The simple presence of a camera phone has unleashed the masquerade spirit into the digital world, challenging the cultural practices and entrenched assumptions of its hometown. The digital medium and the masquerade spirit are informing us that there is a need to innovate these real world spaces and cultural practices in order to remain relevant in a globalizing world. How viable, credible, and sustaining is a cultural practice that bans women and outsiders, but does not ban mobile phones in the 21st digital century? Perhaps, unlike the communities from which the masquerade emerges, the spirits are far more digitally savvy wishing to remain relevant in a digital age of increasing migration, global travel and communication, they have developed a digital strategy, one that embraces the medium and the delicious potential of unsuspecting global audiences. The spirit of the masquerade is already being captured digitally, already entering this new realm in the photography, video and audio recordings, popping up on the mobile phone devices and laptops of people throughout the world, emerging from the digital antholes of YouTube and Facebook no longer restricted to festival periods or particular audiences. One video, one haunting recording, one unsettling photographic still can live forever in the digital realm, rediscovered again and again. Offering a fright, instruction, or a comment on a faraway land. The digital provides us an opportunity to engage with the kinds of historical practices prevalent outside the academic field in the oral traditions, storytelling, and performance most common in African communities across the world. It allows us to reach wider audiences, connect with long lost children of the diaspora, and yet it also presents us with a number of challenges and concerns. How will the digital, while facilitating the capture of the dissemination of a broader, sorry, the capture and dissemination of a broader array of cultural and historical idioms change the very foundations of these practices and our cultures? To bring it slightly back to the desert of the real, Walter Benjamin, in his essay, The Art, The Work of Art in an Age of Mechanical Reproduction, speaks about the loss of aura when a piece of art is reproduced 
and removed from its social and cultural context in which it was created. He suggests artistic items not only lose their uniqueness in this process, but also their meaning becomes obscured as these surrogates are engaged outside their cultural setting. So again, as Onyekechi alluded to this morning, how do Igbos and indeed global African communities begin to tame the digital landscape, the place that will increasingly become the site of our cultural and historical exchanges in order to thrive within this realm in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Very good.